off. I want to welcome everybody to uh, this uh, second annual uh, increment report um, training or refresher or uh, what have you. Um, my purpose today is to go over the process uh, and answer answer anybody's questions. There are a lot of there are a lot of new people to this process, and uh, and there are a lot of there's a lot of collective wisdom in, in, in some of the folks that have joined this call, and I hope that we can have a, a good sharing session, um, particularly about getting sources of data and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, a lot of late churchgoers coming in. Okay, so to begin with, let me just uh, answer the question, what is the increment report? And uh, the practical answer to that is, is that it's an on these days, it's, it's an online compilation of ag agricultural value, the value of agriculture in Texas. And specifically, it is um, calendar year farm gate values of crops, livestock, and then a bunch of extra stuff related to hunting, fishing, forestry, uh, ag-related sorts of things. But it's an attempt to compile uh, the value uh, from year to year. I think that's why they call it increment report because we're interested in the trends and the changes from year to year for all the commodities in your county. Um, so this website here is, uh, first of all, this is where this training is gonna going to wind up the recording of it the late this is last year's if you click on that but uh, we'll have we'll have this session recorded and posted there there's some other little background information about what the report is and isn't what it's used for what it shouldn't be used for and then there's a historical that we've got a dozen years of of reports that exist as pdf files underneath these links here so you can go back and look at your county to get historical perspectives by clicking on the appropriate report here. There's always 13 volumes, one for each district, and the county pages are in those district volumes. And then there's a statewide summary uh, volume. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more detail about what the contents of, of these reports look like, particularly at the county level. But this is this is where this is where you can find it. Um, as I mentioned, it's uh, it's a collection, a compilation of farm gate sales values in a particular calendar year. Um, so the increment report that you're working to develop right now that is due at the end of January is for the year 2021, the year that's winding up. Um, I just want to it's this this process is a chore, um, probably for everybody that's tuning in here. Uh, it's it's a chore for us in Agico too. Um, it comes at a tough time of the year with the holidays and then the stock shows and whatnot. But it's it's uh, hopefully I'll convince you that it's it's a useful it's a useful chore. It can be useful to you uh, as an agent and as an educator. And we use it. Administration uses it for a lot of other things. So I'll touch on that. First of all, I, you know, administrators use it for their evaluation. I know that because every April and May I get contacted for the latest uh, uh, reports from them. But more importantly, all of extension from the county level to the to the director's office uses the increment report data for needs assessment. They want to know what certain trends are in certain regions. Um, not only extension administrators want to know those trends, but congressional staffers and senators' offices and state uh, uh, offices, everybody uh, likes this data and they use this data. Um, I've just got some examples here. You know, the typical kind of stuff that we put out about what's the impact of agriculture, what's the impact of agriculture in your county or in your district or in this congressional district. We get all that from looking at the increment report. There are other sources of data too, USDA and um, namely, but uh, the increment report is the most detailed and it's the most 
current. Uh, therefore, it has it's particularly useful for certain certain kinds of uh, activities like this. Uh, and and like I say, we get calls every year from the comptroller. From actually, we get calls from USDA, uh, and occasionally we get uh, contacted, you know, by legislators and uh, the governor's office and county commissioners and a lot of other people that you know want data for their own uses, like trial lawyers, bankers, realtors um, will uh, contact us for this information. So it's in it's in demand and how it might be useful to you in particular is first of all having having that sort of interpretive information for your own county should be useful uh, and then for specific regulatory things like uh, you know section 18 emergency use labels if you're gonna if you have a pest outbreak in your particular county on a particularly on a like a minor crop and you need data in a hurry about what's the economic impact of that crop uh, the increment report is going to be the, the a good source of uh, that sort of thing. Um, when we are involved, which we are, seems like all the time with, uh, you know, hurricane damages or droughts, like maybe the drought that's beginning to unfold over Texas right now, what the impact is going to be next spring. Again, for certain types of crops, we turn to increment report data because they're the only data that are there for minor crops and stuff like that. So anyway, it's useful. Uh, my whole orientation, really, you know, philosophically as an economist, you know, I believe in self-motivation. And uh, for this process to be meaningful, I, you ought to view it that way, that doing a good job in collecting these data and making them as accurate as you can shouldn't be something that is imposed on you. That's just a chore. It should be something that you want to do, uh, you know, so that you're the properly viewed as the expert of agriculture in your area and, and that you can use those data to, to do your job and, and uh, uh, take care of business. So let's get to the process. We're, we're in the middle of the pro the process is started, not quite in the middle of it, but uh, it's an annual thing. It starts in the fall. We send out to all the counties, snail mail, hard copy packets of worksheets and supporting information state level yields and prices from the previous year, stuff like that. And then we have a county specific report form. The increment report form is, uh, it's basically the last previous four years of gross value, you know, value of agriculture by, by category, by broad category. It's got four years of history and it's got the count, it's got the year that we're working on right now, 2021. And it's got a, a forecasted um, column for 2022 looking ahead. Uh, that business we mail out in November. And then we typically follow up with an email, making sure that you've got, you know, pointing out that the packets went out and that sort of thing. And that email should have also included a generic uh, Excel version of the worksheets. I'll get into that in a second. Um, during this time period, uh, agents are expected to, you know, find out what's going on in their county, get primary data from major agribusinesses, producer groups, what have you. I'll talk about that in detail. And then uh, combine that with secondary data from USDA and uh, from other sources. And then complete the worksheets, which are basically a tool to help you complete the county, your county specific increment report form. And that's what gets turned in to your district extension administrator by the deadline of the end of January. And they forward that to the fifth floor and that gets forwarded to us. And we compile it and error check it and call you back if necessary to double check things that we, that we see to make sure that it's as accurate as possible. And then we, we, used, to, we used to be in the book business and we would make 13 volumes. We would make about 300 copies of those 13 volumes and we'd send it to Austin and upstairs and to the counties and to the extension ag economists. We don't make hard books. We're, we've gotten out of the book business uh, due to budget constraints, but so we're, we're posting the PDF versions online and that's, well, that's where the publication is and will continue to be. Okay. 
So what I'm going to do is go over, spend a lot of time talking about the worksheets, the commodities, and, and how, how to get stuff, to fill out stuff uh, in those worksheets uh, to get to the end product. So just to, I'm starting with the crops worksheet. There's a number of different ones. There's a crops, a livestock, a, a wildlife, and other, other, uh, other commodities worksheet. Um, we send these to you to help you, but I'm gonna be kind of pleading with you, help us by including this business when you, when you send it your stuff in, uh, because having your worksheets is the, it's the best way for us to, to try to figure out what you did when, there, when there's a question. So um, that's my little sermon here. So what kind of calculations are you gonna be putting in a worksheet that, that go into the increment report? Well, again, starting with the crops example, what we're driving towards is this column and this column. I've called it the farm gate value, this, the, the production value of all the crops that are, if whichever of these are in your county, um, we wanna record that and we're driving towards values that we put in this column here. And these are ones for 2021 that we're trying to get data for, for the year that's just finished. Part of the process is also estimating what's gonna happen in the following year, 2022. Um, what I'll tell you is this probably, this is what gets used. This is what I would judge to be the most important. This is what we'd spend a lot of time working on. This is what we spend time following up, ground truthing, error checking. And this version over here typically is just kind of more of a guess and it's a guess based on what these numbers are, often what gets turned in over here is the same, or it's a little bit, you know, it'll be 5% higher, it'll be 5% lower. Uh, you know, 2022 is, first of all, it's in the future and we don't know and a lot can happen. Um, so the things that we want to be reflected over here are, well, if you know that, you know, you can't predict the weather, we're entering a drought period right now, but if you, if you knew that, or if you thought really strongly that next year's weather might impact what the numbers were this year and they might be smaller or bigger you could you could reflect that in what you put over here or if you know that let's say a large chicken integrator is going out of business well then the livestock value related to poultry is going to go from a big number to a small number or maybe to a zero you could reflect things that you know about the future you could put them in here otherwise don't spend that much time on this part this is what I'm gonna be talking about. This is what we're really, really working on, okay? And let me just say, while I'm going through this, there's a bunch of people on the call, that's fine. <clears throat> the easiest way to catch my attention, since I'm doing multiple things and I'm kind of challenged, is to just speak up, unmute yourself and ask a question as we go. That, that would be the best way to, to, uh, uh, to do that. So we're driving towards this and so the things that we put in these worksheets are just data that are part of the calculation that help us help us get to here okay so this is the actual final product this is an example of the increment report form again this would be for your particular county so you can go back online and look at the old reports and see uh, and i think we probably sent you a paper version a county specific paper version of of this report so that you could see in the most recent years what you had, but you've got, you know, three years in the past and we're interested in these estimates right here and the projected ones, which are coming again, they're coming right from here. So this and that are going to here. One big difference just in the recording of it is that here, these are the actual numbers. So let's say you had a million, a million dollars worth of corn that was grown and sold in your county in 2021. On this report, this is reported in thousands. So it would be a thousand, thousand. A thousand is what you would write here for corn here. The, the absolute numbers here are reported in thousands here, okay? So just one thing to keep straight, one of many. Um, while I'm at it here, 
it never fails that uh, the snail mail doesn't arrive or maybe it did arrive and it's gotten its place or the email, you know, whatever. If you didn't get or if you want an electronic version of stuff and you didn't get it, email me at that email right there and I will get it to you. Um, to avoid confusion, I'll just point out that this email here, which we had set up in years past to be a timeless uh, email for y'all to reach us, we found out last year is not working. For some reason, it's broken. And people were emailing me and at this email and not getting a reply. And I don't want that to happen. So just email me straight out, okay, at, at my email right there. And we'll get you whatever you need, worksheets or increment report forms or the electronic versions of them. We'll, we'll get you what you need, as well as just answer your questions that you might have following up this training. Okay. Mr. John, I yes. uh, can't see your cursor when you're showing things. We can't, there's not a... You're not a, seeing my arrow? That's correct, yes. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. I'll be more deliberate about uh, what I'm referring to on the screens then. Okay, so I'm going to go through some of the elements of these different worksheets and point out data sources and also talk a little bit about the way that we classify crops just so that it's clear. So when we're on the crops worksheet, uh, the first thing that you need to know, obviously, to calculate the gross sales over all the crops in your county for the for the year, you need to know what was what the acres were. And then when we say acres, we mean harvested acres because we're going to make a multiplication of harvested acres times yield per acre, times the price, and hopefully keep all those units straight. And, and that's what's going to wind up in this fifth column here, the value of crop production. So let's talk about acreage data. Um, there's a number of different sources, both primary data and secondary data that you can get acres from. Um, in terms of primary data, what I mean is local data, local sources that you identify and go talk to. So who would that be in the world of crops? That would be the major buyers and processors uh, of those crops and or their commodity organizations if they have them. So for example, you know, businesses like gins and elevators are volume businesses and they're, they're generally pretty up on how many acres of uh, cotton in the case of the cotton gins or corn and sorghum in the case of the elevators, they, they have an idea about what's out there. And so you could be getting that information from them. Um, when we talk about livestock, the same thing with the packers and feedlots and processors. Um, also, if you're, in, if you're in a part of the state where there's a commodity organization like out in the Plains, you know, Plains Cotton Growers represents 41 counties. They're connected with all the gins in those counties. The staff at Plains Cotton Growers knows a, they, they keep a running tally on estimates of the acres of cotton in their 41 counties. It's the same probably for the Texas wheat growers and Texas corn growers. So if, if you know contacts in those organizations, they, they're probably a good source of primary data for acreage. Um, secondary data, when I refer to that, I mean government collected stuff so usually we think USDA. So there's three different sources of acreage data that I'm familiar with. Uh, the first and the one I would not recommend is uh, the Risk Management Agency. They have, they have data for crops planted within a certain year, but they don't have a very user-friendly website. And I, I get confused when I go there, so I, I don't go there very often. Uh, the next two sources of data are, are good uh, particularly for different uses, um, if you need, which we do for this process, if you need acreage for the current year or the year just finished, that's hopefully very detailed. The best source of that is USDA Farm Services Agency, and it's their certified acreage data. And I'll talk more about that on the next slide. The best source of his recent historical data, including acreage, as well as yield and production, would be from the USDA National Ag Statistics Service or NAS. They've got a website, which I'm gonna to refer to at least three times in this presentation. And it's at this link here. I'm gonna, if you went to that link, this is the National Ag Statistics Service link. You would see something that looks like this. 
we call this site the quick stats because of these terms right here, the quick stat sites. It's a handy way to get at the major crops that are grown in your county that's county specific. So if you click on any one of the any one of these crop links under quick stats, it's going to take you to a list of Texas counties and you can scroll down and find your county and you can find out about the recent like you could probably what's there is corn in 2020 and corn in 2019. That's what it would be there. It'll show you planted acres, harvested acres, yield um, and total production in your county. Um, and that's not that's not the data you need to do a 2021 calculation, but I'm just saying if you're new to your county and you kind of need to get oriented, looking at these data are a good way to get oriented to the crop production in your county, the recent history. The other, the other way that it is useful for the increment report is when you're out talking to your primary sources and you go to the elevator and he says, well, I think corn acres are 5% higher this year than they were last year. Well, you can you can go find out what last year was by going and looking it up on quick stats for your county. So there is a basis for you to, to do that. So it, it, it's useful there. When we get to talking about livestock, we're gonna come back here and find another use for this quick stats stuff. But that's that link is useful. So I point that one out to you. The next one I already highlighted was the certified acres data. Now what certified acres is, precisely is farmers will go every year and in the summertime, they will go down to the FSA, not all of them, but they'll go down, a lot of them will go down to the FSA office and they'll basically write a report of what they planted. They do it for insurance purposes, for disaster program purposes and farm program purposes. So I'd say a majority of them probably, probably certify their acres, which gives us a real time, not a real time, a couple months delayed uh, set of acreage data. And the good thing about it is that it's very, very detailed. You'll get data on all the major crops and then you'll get data on vegetables and minor crops and all kinds of stuff. And it'll, and it'll also give you other information about, well, how much of that wheat was just baled or how much of it was grown out for grain or how much of it was grazed. It'll, it'll tell you the disposition of those acres. So there's a whole bunch of detail that is, is very useful for our purposes for the increment report. It's probably the most important set of government data that, that you could find would be the certified acres in filling out the crops part of your, and the, and the vegetables part of your increment report. If you click on that, which is the same link here, if you click on that, this'll come up right here. So you can see that in 2021, the first certified acres data report came out in August. And then they updated it in September and they updated it a couple of times in the late fall. If you click on that, it'll pull up something that looks like this, which is hard to read. But uh, what it is, is a national list of certified acres stuff. So it starts alphabetically with Alabama in the fourth column and Autauga County in the fifth column, which we don't need those. But if you scroll down this, Large, what it did, it was it actually it loads an Excel file, and that, that's what you're looking at. It loads and opens and loads an Excel file on your computer, and you get this big old file, and you'll scroll down to Texas and scroll down to your county, and then it'll tell you you probably can't read that, but it's got wheat, cotton, corn, beans, peas, peppers, soybeans, CRP land, grassland, cabbage, pecans. It's very, very detailed. And like I say, it, it gives you the planted acres and then it gives you the disposition of some of those, some of those acres. If some failed, if some were grazed out and that sort of thing, it, it tells you that. So it's very useful data. Uh, so I, I want you to be aware of that. If you're, if you're not familiar with it, it's something you probably ought to be wanting to fetch every summer for the crop that's going on that year. All right. So those were all just different ways of, of getting the necessary acres, harvested acres data. The next thing we would need is yield data. Where do we get that from? Yeah, some of the same sources that you get acreage data. You, you, know, you can talk to growers, you can talk to your crops committees. You can also talk to you know, people in the know, your agronomy specialists for particular crops. Um, and we're talking yields here. So you know the, the agronomists, probably have field data, 
probably in collaboration with your own variety trials. So that, you know, that should be a source of, of, of data. Um, if you need a, kind of a historical perspective on yields, you can get that from that NAS. This, this website, again, the quick stats site, buy crop, scroll down to your county, and you can get the most recent two years of yield data. And again, that's helpful if you, if you get feedback from, from knowledgeable sources that, well, yields are going to be X percent higher or lower than they were last year. Well, then you can go get last year's yield and, and figure out what they probably are. So that's, that's yields. Uh, we multiply acres and yield together to get the third column, which is, says volume produced. If you have the electronic version of the worksheet, there's an embedded formula there that simply multiplies acres times yield to, to grow those numbers automatically. And then that volume produced has to get multiplied by a price. So let's talk about price data. Hey, Dr. Robinson, can I yes. ask a question? Yes, sir. Yeah, so just remind me, are these going to be submitted because you mentioned um, electronic or y'all want hard copy or does it matter or? Um, if you did it on electronic, if you did it electronically, it would, I, well, let me just say it this way. We did it both ways. I think the DEAs, if there's one on the call, please correct me. I think the DEAs are expecting hard copies submitted to them, I think because then we get those hard copies forwarded to us. Um, the reason I like hard copy stuff is it, it allows for including of extra calculations and scribbles and things, which we find incredibly useful when we, when we have them on these worksheets. Um, and that's fine. I just wanted to get a clarification. On sure. It. The most useful thing to me would be for me to be able to see whatever background assumptions that you made and were scribbled on the worksheet in the corners and stuff that that could really only be included if you sent me a hard copy so i would prefer okay, hard thank copies. you and then a lot of the links that you're you're talking about are those going to be sent out like later or i know um, somebody posted one in the i'm having a hard time copying the links yeah i'll tell you what we can what i am going to do is post this uh the, the recording of this Zoom session, and then you could stop and get them off of there. The, the Zoom session of, from last year, uh, if you go there, it's I'm following the same outline. Those links are in, in that one. I mean, you, okay, could get them, you could get them this afternoon. Appreciate it. And if anybody just needs me to send them those links, I'll stick them in a, I'll stick them in an email and I can, you know, I can email them to you. Uh, okay. Sources of data, when we're talking about prices, again, you can get price data from, from various sources. Secondary sources would include USDA, here's another acronym, AMS, which is the Ag Marketing Service. Uh, they, you know, they call around the country every day and talk to elevators and talk to merchant buyers. And they're, they're the ones, the data that's read on the radio farm show is from USDA AMS, what cash prices and bids and offers and that sort of thing. So you, you can get data from them. Um, you can get data from buyers, you know, like grain elevators or the gens don't buy, but they facilitate buying. So they generally know what stuff is being offered for. And if we're talking vegetables, you know, packing sheds. And if we're talking livestock, feedlots, slaughterhouses, that sort of thing. Other knowledgeable people include ag lenders. If you are friends with or go to church with or golf with an ag lender, he, He's got a whole portfolio of probably conservative prices and yields, but they're, I find that they're usually knowledgeable and useful people to talk to. Again, those same commodity groups uh, generally know what the market conditions are for their crops. Um, here in Ag Eco, I'm sort of the cotton market guy. We have a grain market guy, uh, Mark Welch, and a livestock marketing guy, David Anderson. And you can email us, call us anytime and you know, ask what, uh, what prices were for 21 or what prices might be for next year. Uh, that's our job and, and we'd be happy to help you get that question answered. So prices, acres, yields, all kind of the same thing as far as going out and getting data from knowledgeable local sources and useful uh, government sources. And so if you stick all that 
all those things we've been talking about, just as one example, and you're filling out your worksheet, you know, here's just, here's an example of how you might do it. If you found out from your FSA certified acres that you had 10,000 acres of wheat that went to grain, you'd put that 10,000 there on that first cell. And if you found out from, um, you know, knowledge your crops committee or from uh, your district agronomist that an average wheat yield in this year that's passed was 20 bushels, you can put that in there and go ahead and put the units in there uh, to keep yourself straight and to help us out after the fact. So that would multiply through to 200,000 bushels in your county in 2021. And if you call up Mark Welch and got a price, which $4 a bushel is probably too low, but anyway, this is just an example. You put that price in there, keep your units straight, and then multiply through 200,000 bushels times $4 a bushel will give you $800,000. That's the absolute number, $800,000 in this worksheet. When you translate that to the increment report on the line for wheat, you wouldn't put 800,000 because it's already in thousands. You would put 800, okay? But that's, this is just, a, just an example of, how we, how we go about filling it out. You would do that for all the crops that are in your county that you had similar data for, okay? Pretty straightforward, I think. Um, now let's talk for a second about how we classify crops because we sort of have our own system. You can see here these categories, food crops, feed crops, oil crops. So just real quick, what we consider a food crop is, you know, probably the same as what you would, anything that you people eat or distill. Anyway, wheat, rice, rye, those are all food crops. The confusion comes in typically with corn because in our world, uh, food corn can be a food crop if it's white corn, uh, typically grown under contract for somebody like Azteca, you know, to make chips and tortillas with, all right? That kind of corn. If you have the acres of that specifically, uh, you would you would put it in the under food crops. Uh, sweet corn, in our way of thinking, isn't corn at all. At least it's not a grain. Um, we classify it under vegetables, so it's it's on the vegetables worksheet on its own line item. So don't be confused by that. Sweet corn is a vegetable to us, and feed corn is going to be what we would all call field or yellow corn. All right. Probably more confusing is the hay. Uh, under feed crops, we have hay, but what we mean by hay is grass hay, okay? Alfalfa hay is somewhere else. It comes under miscellaneous crops. I apologize for the, you know, why do we do it that way? Well, I'm sure it just sort of evolved and I inherited that way and I haven't changed it. Uh, so for the time being, let's just keep straight. Uh, when we mean hay, hay is a feed crop, grass hay. Alfalfa hay is a miscellaneous crop. I'll show you that worksheet in a little bit. Um, so there's that wheat example there under food crops. Uh, a little more detail on feed crops. Again, you got to pay attention to units because that's one major source of, of error is when things get put in there and the units are not consistent. Um, here's different kinds of hay crops that can be included. Um, silage is a feed crop in our world. So all of that would be included under feed crops. And I've got some numbers in here for corn to illustrate what typically happens a few times every year. Let's say you, again, got from the FSA certified acres that there were 10,000 acres of corn in 2021. So you put that in there. And let's say that you talk to somebody and let me just tell you elevators and farmers when they refer to corn yields they might give it to you in bushels but as often as not they're going to give it to you in hundred weights so let's say you talk to a farmer and all your corn is irrigated in your county and he thinks that the typical uh 2021 yield for corn was 200 pounds or 200 weights per acre so you put that in there and you multiply that through and you, again, you go over to Dr. Welch and get a price for corn and he tells you $4 a bushel. Believe me, that's too low. It would have been higher. And you multiply all that through. The trouble is there's, there's at least two errors in what I just laid out for you as an example. The first, the first error is that in that volume produced column, it didn't have any units. 
if we'd have had units there, that might have kept us straight. But what that is is 20,000 hundredweights, strictly speaking. And then we multiplied a hundredweight number times a dollar per bushel number and came up with the wrong final answer. The, the correct answer is we'd have to convert, keep it all in the same units, either have the price be a dollar per hundredweight price or convert your volume to bushels, which there's a conversion table down here. How many pounds are in a bushel of corn? So the correct answer, the way I would do it is you get 20,000 hundredweights and you multiply that times 100 to get 2 million pounds and then divide that by 56 to get whatever bushels that is and multiply that times the bushel price and it gives you the correct value. Anyway, just be careful about units, whatever, whatever commodity we're talking about, because we will typically see that kind of error. Um, if we have your worksheets, we can figure it out pretty quick. If we don't, you know, if the if we may not catch it, um, if if the difference between the real answer of 142,000 and the wrong answer of 80 really isn't that great percentage wise, and so it might not it might slip through our filter, our error check filter. So help us out, send your worksheet along with your calculations in it. Even if you did it electronically and you just printed it, send us that hard copy because then we can see what you did and if you included um, included the, uh, the units or not. What else do we wanna talk about? Oil crops is another category which includes regular oil seeds. We're thinking sesame, canola, uh, sunflowers, and then cotton is in there too. Um, when you're getting data on oil crops, you know, they're frequently grown under contract. So the growers could tell you what price they got. The, the growers may not know how many total acres there were. You might have to get, make contact with the, you know, the processor, the, the buyer, the one who wrote all the contracts to find out the total acreage. And then cotton, uh, is kind of unique in that cotton production results in the production of both lint as an output and cotton seed as an output. So the way we do it in the worksheet is whatever you put down for your yield for lint is what we use with a factor to calculate your cotton seed per acre. And then you would multiply your lint yield times a price and your seed yield times a price. So let me give you an example for that. Let's say you had 10,000 acres of cotton. Let's say that from knowledgeable sources, you think the yield is 800 pounds per acre. That gives you 8 million pounds of cotton. Rather than come up with an independent yield of seed, what you can simply do is use this factor here and come up with that much tons per acre based on that yield. And that, that gives you this many tons when you multiply it times 10,000 acres. And then you can multiply those two things times prices the way we were doing before and come up with the total, the total number. Now, again, if you have the electronic version of this spreadsheet, there's formulas in here that do this automatically for you. But otherwise you would just take that cotton yield in pounds per acre and use this conversion to get tons of seed per acre to come up with that figure. And then you keep going, okay? All right, there's an example. And yeah, these numbers are just an example. This doesn't reflect 2021 at all. Okay, there's a whole other vegetable worksheet. <clears throat> we have major vegetable crops that have their own line item. And then because there are so many minor crops, we have a category of other vegetables. So the major Vegetables are, you know, ones you'd expect, cantaloupes, honeydews, watermelons. There are more exotic melon types than just those. So if you've got other melons, I would stick them in the, can the honeydew line. That's what we typically do. Remember that sweet corn has its own line in the vegetable worksheet. And, you know, having worked in the valley, I can tell you there are, pl there are plenty of other stuff. Um, and, and if it isn't a, a direct line for it, you can just put it in other vegetables. 
Uh, one thing I would tell you about vegetables particularly is, again, be careful with the units. The same point I made before, you have to have your, have your yield and your price and your be in the same units. But the thing about vegetables particularly is that there are some weird vegetable units. Um, things like, you know, seven eighth bushel baskets is, is a unit for some vegetables or 21 pound cartons of citrus. They're just, to me, they're strange not being familiar uh, with that industry anymore. And so just, okay, if your units are in those kind of oddball units, then you need to be multiplying them times um, the same price per unit or the price for the same unit. Just be careful, be careful. John, All right, so yes. Uh, question, quick question. Yes, sir. So what would be considered a reasonable amount to uh, record or to, um, to acknowledge? You mean like if there's 50 acres of some weird crop, should you bother with it? Yes. Or I mean, in like if you're not in a, uh, you know, if you're not in the valley and, you know, and you got a few uh, uh, row crops, you know, a guy right. that, you know, that's got 10 acres of melons here, uh, you know, what's considered a valuable amount to uh, to record? Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't quibble with you if you simply went off, if you go get the certified acres report for that year, it's going to have a whole bunch of detailed stuff on it. I don't know that I would go too far beyond that because I can use the certified acres to document what's there. There's a, it's always going to underestimate slightly. I mean, there's, there's people out there with a half with big gardens, you know, there's people out there with a half acre of this, that, or the other you're not really going to pick that up unless you're best friends with the packing shed guy. And he gives you all that detail. You know, I'm, I'm all for detail, but I, it, it doesn't cost me anything. You got to draw the line. So, right. And that's, and I guess that's what, you know, what I'm trying to figure out. Like I said, you know, if I got a guy here uh, that's, you know, growing five acres of watermelons for the farmer's market, you know, yeah. uh, is that a considerable amount of numbers? I mean, I know what he's got, but I mean, is that considerable to say it has an impact or not impact in, in Nacogdoches County? Well, it, it might be, imp I could dream up a hypothetical. It might be important if, like I say, if there was some kind of uh, pest label or something and we wanted to, the entomologists, you know, wanted to document every acre of watermelons everywhere we could, you know, we'd want to include whatever we could. Um, but you know, if I was in your shoes, I would, I would make my decision based on how hard it is to get the, you know, if it was just a matter of calling him up and saying, what's your production, what was your selling price? And he told you, and those were the only watermelons in your County. You could put that right on the watermelon category. That wouldn't take very long if it was just that, but if it's piecemeal, you know, little watermelons over here and a little over here and a little over there. You know, you, you can't spend all day. You know, it's a full-time job if you tried to track down everything. So right. I, I would just say use your best judgment, but I would start, I would start with the certified acres data okay. and just sort of fill it out from there. Okay. And good, I, Dr. Robinson? Good question. If, yeah, Wilson. If, if, could, if I, could I just add that it, it does mention in uh, our correspondence with the county extension agents that if the receipt of total sales is not over a thousand dollars um do not list it so so unless okay. it's a thousand dollars it probably doesn't need to be listed so just okay. from the from that standpoint I, I had forgotten that but so apparently apparently that question has been asked before and we came up with a rule so so yeah make a judgment on the value of it then okay and i guess that would be the same thing with uh with animals you know like if yeah uh you know, hogs is not a big uh, livestock animal in my county, but I know there's some backwood, you know, or I right. shouldn't say backwoods. There's some small guys out there that that feed hogs. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you okay. could use the same criteria. And, you know, if, if you think it's over a thousand, you know, if it's earning over a certain level, then chase after it. OK. Good questions. 
All right. More on the miscellaneous crops. Um, I'll make the same comment for fruits and nuts that I did for vegetables. There are some weird fruit units. I say weird. They're traditional. But that citrus one, you know, 21 pound carton, I'm like, who dreamed up that? But anyway, so just be, be careful with your units. Also, if you're not familiar with, you know, orchard crops, nut crops, there's a lot of variation physically from year to year in the yield. So, you know, if you see big swings, you know, 50% less production from year to year, well, it's, you know, you get that pecan boom and bust year cycle going. That just explains the variation just so it doesn't throw you. Um, other miscellaneous crops, remember that includes alfalfa, just other stuff. It'll include hemp. It includes sugarcane because there's just 40 something thousand acres of sugarcane. And everything else that doesn't have a line item is going to wind up here. So, uh, again, be careful with units. And, you know, if, 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 if there's any particular info about that particular county or that particular crop, you know, include it on the worksheet, scribble it on there. Give, give us background information if that information is useful to explain what, what this is. <clears throat> One other thing I'll say about this section of nursery stuff and turf, you know, if you're in a county reasonably close to an urban area, you're going to have turf production and container plant production and it's probably high dollar but you know the, the the acres times yield kind of thing really doesn't make sense typically what you what you might get if you go to those businesses they're going to tell you well we had five million dollars in gross sales they're going to get a number that just simply fits right into the value of production column so you you know don't worry about acres acres and and Yield is not going to make sense in this context. So just get whatever sales, gross sales values you can and, and include them. Okay. All right. All right. Moving on to livestock. Um, just some considerations. When it comes to livestock, there is a certain fix, fixedness uh, because of herd size, you know, it takes a while for a cattle herd to get bigger or smaller. It takes a while for a poultry industry to kind of stock up and, and grow. There are big discrete changes, like if integrators are present or not. So things can happen that'll kind of explain a lot of the presence or growth or de decline of, of livestock, certain kinds of livestock. And, what I guess what I'm trying to say is there are certain dynamics across years that you have to pay attention to that'll help explain what you've got. And I, you know, not knowing anything about livestock, where I would start is, you know, having discussions with those producers and having discussions with knowledgeable specialists, uh, probably in animal science and poultry science. So when we're talking about cattle specifically, there's sort of two different groups of production. The first is the value added group. Now we're, we're thinking, we're thinking fed, fed beef, or we're thinking stocker cattle. The value is in the gain. Okay. It's not, it's not the production of the animal. It's the production of the weight, the production of the gain. Um, there's a lot of room for errors in here. I'll show you in the example coming up. But that's that's there's a whole group that's like that. And then the other the other group is the whole animal production, which would simply you know be what we think of with cow calf production, but also breeding stock, culls, show animals, that sort of thing. You're you're producing an entire animal and selling it, so the the gross sales is the total dollar per head sales. So let's let's look at examples of both of those. So. In the livestock worksheet, again, we've got our own categories. So we've got a category called fed beef and then value added. We put that in there to remind you that we're focused on, we're focused on the gain, okay? So this is your typical kind of calculation. And I got these numbers from David Anderson. 
this is a, a West Central um, example. These are, I believe these are current, or these were numbers for 2021, as far as the typical uh, feeder weight and the typical slaughter weight and the associated price per head. So again, we're getting at the value of the gain here. And so you can, you can do this math and come up with the subtraction that the value was $506.03 worth of, worth of gain. That's the value. And so on the worksheet, here's, here's all David's numbers, which I'll include in the presentation, just so that you can, up there at the top is where the starting and finishing weights are and where the $144 price and the $1.19 price is. Where you would put that in the worksheet on the fed beef value added category is you put it in there like this, that calculation gave you a $506 per head value of gain, which you would multiply times the number of head. I'm assuming in this county, for this example, there's 5,000 head. So that multiplies through to $2 million. Now there's not enough line, not enough room on this line to include all the calculations that went into that. So here's an example of what I would thank you for if you give it to me, if you turn in a hard copy of your worksheet, do, do like I did here, just you know, draw a line over to the margin and put that little calculation so that it's clear to me that you know, these were the prices you were using, these were the weights that you were assuming, finishing and ending, and that's how you came up with the 50603. Uh, do that and it'll make life a lot easier and it'll help keep you straight and it'll certainly help us out after the fact. Okay. So that's the value of the gain for, uh, for fed beef. Stocker cattle, are, it's the same, same concept. So here are summer stockers example from the West central region. You're starting in March with a lighter weight animal. You're finishing in October. You got the price differences there. You multiply through and subtract the value of the March starter from the from the October uh, finished, and you come up with that value per head, and that's that's gain. You know what that's that assumes it assumes you know a certain time period, a certain average daily gain. All those assumptions are scribbled out there. You could scribble those assumptions and and these background calculations. You could, uh, you could scribble them onto your worksheet. I'll point out that don't be surprised. <laughs> Hopefully it won't happen this year, but <clears throat> you can get negative numbers in this calculation. Uh, if, if, uh, if prices tank in the middle of the season, it's happened before. Um, and if it's negative, it's negative. But uh, here's how that would be filled out on the stalker cattle line. These are summer stalkers. You're filling them into the stalker cattle value added line. Again, you can kind of draw a little arrow over to a, whatever notes, whatever assumptions you wanted to put in the margin. Uh, that would hopefully help you out. It certainly will help us out. I'm assuming 7,500 stalkers in this county and multiplied times that value of gain gives you the total. Okay. All right, keep going. So what about winter stalkers, wheat stalkers? So this is also from the West Central region. This is from a couple of years ago. Uh, from Taylor County. So this is just a technique for getting at the number of wheat stockers. You can, you can back into the number of stocker cattle based on the available wheat acreage. If it's a very common thing for the wheat acreage to be grazed, which it is in this part of the world. Uh, how could you get the wheat acreage? Well, you, I would point you towards the FSA certified acreage data because they give you the wheat acreage and they give you in particular they give you the the grazed the GZ is the grazed out wheat acreage and they give you the the GS designation is where they graze them and then pull them off and then let the wheat go to grain and you've got different acreage for different amounts for both of that so here's an example of how you can back into the number of calves um, you have to know something about a stocking rate. Now, I don't know anything about livestock. So where would I get a typical stocking rate, early winter stocking rate? I'd get it from an animal scientist or, or a knowledgeable rancher. Uh, but if you have that stocking rate and you know the acres of 
uh, what was grazed and then before they pulled them off, you could you could divide that through and come up with an estimate of 12,000 plus calves. Uh, you could go through an exercise such as we did before about the value per head of a starter and the value when you pull them off and to come up with that $231 at the bottom of the slide that's computed externally. Where'd I get that from? I got it from David Anderson right over in the middle or on the pull off under winter stockers pull off. There's a, there's a price. There's the assumed weights to start to finish. There's the assumed prices. You can do a calculation and come up with $231 and 17 cents for the gain of those stockers. Multiply that times the number of calves and you come up with a total number for the ones that were pulled off early. For the ones that were grazed out, that's a smaller number of acres. It's a lower stocking rate, but you basically do the same exercise. And again, using David's numbers, you can back into the number of calves and multiply it times the value of the gain per calf and come up with a total. And then you can add up that $405,000 times that $2.8 million and come up with a total value, which you would put in the, in the worksheet. Now, if you had done summer stockers already, you pr you've used up the line for stockers. So you can, you can adapt this worksheet any way you want. If there's something on there that you're not going to use, like in this case, dairy calves, you can scratch that out and put winter stockers and put your data there. And then you can also, again, draw a line to the margin, make whatever notes, assumptions, background calculations you want to keep yourself straight and to help us out to figure out what you did. Um, again, this these worksheets were invented for you. It's kind of like the Sabbath. Uh, the worksheet was invented for you and not the other way around. So make, make it work for you. This is just an example or a suggestion of, of how you could adapt it. Okay, so that was the that was the examples with stockers and fed cattle of the value of game. Now we're talking about the value of animals produced. So so the, the associated values are going to be a dollar per head of the sales of a whole animal. So we think of calves and you know cow calf production stuff is going to get reported on a in a category called other beef slash calves. And then there's other beef slash breeder cattle. And there's other beef slash slaughter cattle where we put cold cows and bulls. So there's, there's lines for each one of those. Now, kind of a trick to help you uh, guesstimate uh, how many calves are produced in my county, if you didn't already have a firm idea of that, or how many culls do I have? Uh, one way you can get at that is to start with the inventory of cows in your county which is something that USDA estimates, I think, twice a year. And they publish it in this quick stats link that I sent you before. Down there at the bottom, if you go to that link, down there at the bottom, it says beef cows, milk cows, and all cattle quick stats. If you click on that, scroll down to your county, you're going to get a January 1 inventory number and I think a July 1 inventory number. It's going to tell you the number of cows in your county. And that's a useful number to have because it lets you kind of ground truth your estimate of how many calves were produced, how many cows were culled, and how many bulls were culled. So let's go through an example of that. Again, this is from 2021 for the west central part of the state. Uh, let's say, now I don't, the cattle inventory is probably not 9,200 cows, but let's just pretend that it was. You, Go look on that NAS site and it says that the inventory is 9,200 cows. So you need to know something about the weaning percentage. I don't know anything about livestock. So where would I get that from? I would get it from a knowledgeable rancher or an animal science major or not a major, <laughs> an animal science specialist or, uh, or somebody like that. Uh, if you know the weaning percentage, you can multiply it times the number of cows to get an estimate of the number of calves produced. You can divide that 50-50 to get the number of bull calves versus the number of heifer calves. 
you could subtract off a certain percentage of the heifers as replacement heifers. That gives you the number in the middle. Um, no, it implies that you would have 3,818 steers to sell. And I would get data again from David Anderson's cheat sheet about just the dollars per head for sales value. You could get it from a sale barn too, if your sale barn manager is a knowledgeable you know, person for the year that is just wrapped up. But anyway, apply a dollars per head value to the number of steers, making assumptions about the weight. And if you do that, you can come up with a total value of the steers sold. You can come up with a total value of the heifers sold, net the ones that were held back. Combine that and you get a total value of four, $4.6 million for calf production. Here's David's cheat sheet. So he made assumptions about the value of a 475 pound steer versus the, a 475 pound heifer. And that's what I used for those calculations there. Okay. And you could put that stuff on the other beef dash calves come a beef line. And it goes there. Again, there's a lot of background assumptions, calculations that you could have that underlie this entry that you could include in the margin. And hopefully that would help keep you straight and it would certainly help us. So go ahead and add them. All right, coals, you kind of do the same way. If you have an estimate of what the annual typical coal rate is, you can apply it to the 9,200 cow inventory number and come up with an estimate of the number of cow, cull cows and make some assumptions about the weight of those, if it's a thousand pounds or 10 hundred weights and what the selling price is, which I got from David, multiply that through, put it into other beef slaughter cattle. I guess after you combine it with the, with the bulls, you come up with a total of almost $900,000, which you would put into there. Here's another example of me scribbling some assumptions and notes about what went into that entry. All right, moving on to other stuff. Uh, you know, we've got obviously other major livestock categories. Um, you know, poultry is something that uh, if you, if the integrator will talk to you, you'll probably learn everything there is to know about production in your county um, of that particular thing. It's also important to, to know about, you'll have big discrete changes in poultry production just based on more houses going in or going out or integrators closing up shop and moving on. So that's, that's important to keep track of the pulse of that. Um, there's a worksheet called Other Ag Related Income, which is sort of a catch-all for a lot of stuff. Aquaculture is listed there. By aquaculture, we mean like catfish ponds or shrimp ponds or stuff like that. What we, what's listed as fishing, I would think of as like guided fishing. Uh, furs and pelts, horses, which is, that's a per head kind of thing. We're, we're, we're concerned about the number fold, you know, the number fold and sold. So it's like calf production. Uh, hunting would be the value associated with leases. And whether it's day leases or, or uh, and there's another worksheet actually that feeds into that, that goes into detail about different kinds of leases and then timber and Christmas trees. And exotic animals here is not the hunting of them. It's the production of them on a per head basis, if you have that kind of info. Uh, here's the specific hunting worksheet, which breaks out things by whether you're leasing total range land or I guess part of your ranch. Uh, you know, people, some ranchers do things differently. They'll lease their total ranch for deer hunting. They'll lease part of their ranch, part of the time for exotic hunting. Again, the, the worksheet was made for your benefit. You just make it fit whatever's going on in your county, whatever you have data for, make it fit, um, uh, make it work for you. If, it, if leasing is broken out by individual uh, animal, then they, we give you the opportunity to reflect that 
if you know it, if you have data that way. Uh, okay, I'll skip on here. Okay, so this is getting to the end. Um, just a couple of reminders. Remember that the report form, the increment report form is reflected in thousands. So when you're summarizing all these values from your worksheets, you need to divide them by a thousand before you enter them into the increment report form. Um, when it comes to, again, projecting for 2022, again, what most agents, what I see most agents doing is simply putting the same thing that they worked on laboriously for 2021, and they may tinker with it slightly. This will be a little higher. This will be a little lower. But you know, most of our emphasis is on the 2021 data crunching. And that's the same sermon I preached at the beginning. And that's the workshop. So that's everything I had to say there. I included all that stuff so it'll be in the recording so that you can go back and reference it. Um, any questions anybody has, I'll stay on as long as as long as long um, you want me to. So, and I'm gonna keep the PowerPoint up. Somebody chatted something. Okay. So if you have any specific questions, how to, how to do something, a particular crop situation, livestock situation in your county, go ahead. I'll take my best shot. I'll probably have to go ask somebody else and then get back to you if it's about livestock. Hey, Dr. Robinson, Bob McCool. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm well. Hey, my, my question or comment, so to say, would be maybe on the projections for the, the year uh, coming up. What I mean, in reality, there's no way to to really get very accurate. Right. Would it be something that y'all might look at? Is just instead of doing projections, maybe acres anticipated or uh, cows cow numbers remaining constant instead of doing the projections as far as money and head and yeah. Instead, just the, the acreage, maybe if you've got 100,000 acres of uh, sorghum and 100,000 acres of cotton, other than doing that, what do the projections actually accomplish? I, I, <laughs> I think, they're, they're, frankly, we don't use them very much. I suppose if there was some specific question I, I suppose that they were they were invented or they were required in the past because people anticipated there might be some specific situation where if we had a projection about a particular thing, it could answer some forthcoming question. I, I don't know, Bob, to be honest, they're not used very much. So kind of going back to, I guess, Ricky's first question, how much time do you spend on something like that? I personally wouldn't. I don't, I'm not going to say blow it off, but I would just. I wouldn't spend that much time unless I just had a reason to think, well, acres of this crop are probably going to get lower. So, you know, you could go in and just take your 21 numbers and for a particular crop or two or enterprise, if you have a reason to suspect they might be higher or lower for whatever reason, just multiply them by, you know, increase them by 5% or decrease it by 5%. I mean, and I don't expect a whole bunch of calculations of yield and acres and, and whatever for those next year's projections. Well, it's not that the, it, it's not that it's hard to figure per se. It's just it just seems that you know we could put something in there that would be more relevant, just like anticipated acres of corn, cotton. Uh, whether we project the up or down slide in cow numbers. And those those things kind of tell you the story more so than yeah. all all of the numbers. I'm just saying maybe in, in future it may be something that could be easily more easily done and have a better 
uh, picture of what's happening. Only project production. Oh, I'll, I'll make a note of it. We we kind of we brainstorm in the off season, so. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Yes, Dr. Robinson, this is J.D. Raglan up in Randall County. Yes, sir. Hey, I don't really have a question, just kind of a comment. Uh, I know we've maybe got some younger agents on as well as experience, but one thing that's always been difficult for me with this particular report, the Ag Increment Report, is there is no differential uh value on this report placed on dry land versus irrigated. And I've always struggled with that. I think, honestly, someday we should take a hard look at splitting those because it is such a big difference, particularly up here in our part of the world. But uh, just to remind those listening, I guess this is the way I've been doing it. I hope it's right. You just sim simply have to take an average of both. Yeah. Yeah, you'd have to, yeah, weight them and average them. That's the only way I could could think of it. Which is, yeah, extra work when you when you've got both to deal with. I mean, they're like separate crops almost, but you're reporting them on one line, so you've got to combine them. So yeah. So again, not a question, just kind of a general comment, but. You know, that's always challenging, probably more so up here in our neck of the woods than anywhere. But uh, yeah, there is big, big difference no matter what crop you're growing uh, from a dry land basis as opposed to irrigated. Yeah. And I can envision that would get a little complicated, you know, if, like if you had acreage data, but you didn't know whether how much of the acreage was one or the other. And then you, if you knew a bunch of it failed, you know, you, you're left having to make assumptions about, well, probably the dry land failed. What's left is the irrigated. So you apply an irrigated yield to that. It, it's a, it, there's a challenge there, you know, because there, there's extra assumptions that have to be made to combine them. I, I, I'll give you that. The FSA documents that you get from them normally has irrigated and dry land. Yeah, actually, that's right. It has, it has by practice, irrigated and dry land practice. So it would let you separate them. So that way, if you had irrigated yields and dry land yields, you could apply them accordingly and then just add them all. Here's the value associated with the irrigated production, the value associated with the dry land production, add them all up into one big number and then scribble all that in the margin so that, so that I know what you did. Yeah, sure. I understand. And, and that's what we do. But uh, just making a case in point, you know, it, it, it's hard. Sometimes I, I really struggle with putting those numbers down because just like the scenario you explained, if we lose all our dry land acres on cotton, say, for example, and all we report is irrigated, is that really true to the county what it made? Yes, it is. If you're looking at straight irrigated, but not so much on the dry land side. Right, yeah, now I hear what you're saying. Now, I'll, I wrote that down and I'll, we'll ponder that too. Yeah, I'm not asking you to change anything. Right. I just, like I said, making a general comment. Yeah. We ponder a lot of things. Group because I felt like we might have some some uh, young agents on here that sure. might struggle with the same thing I do. And I've been doing it for 34 years. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, will the PowerPoint be on the website? Well, it'll, it, the slides themselves, could be the the recording of the Zoom will have the PowerPoint, you know, in it, answering Liz's question. Any other questions from anybody? How to 
how to do something or another. If not, I appreciate your attention. Again, if you have issues that come up, email me directly. Don't uh, don't rely don't rely on that old uh, email that we had set up for convenience because it stopped working on us, and that was before the migration. So I shudder to think of what would happen now. So email me or call me, and uh, we'll get you taken care of as soon as we can. So everybody have a good holiday. Stay safe. We'll talk to you later.